introduction. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jim Rodka. I'm chair of the Department of Surgery. On behalf of myself and Karen Devon, who's our lead in surgical ethics in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto, gives us great pleasure to introduce this year's 2022 uh, Belfour Lecture in Surgical Ethics. And we have a great presentation today, uh, and we'll be hearing from both Rob Stewart and Marie Fannin shortly. Uh, but just in advance of that, I, would, I do want to begin with a land acknowledgement. So you can read along with me. Uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Our treaty obligations and commitment include learning about the history of these lands and territory and the structured dispossession that Indigenous nations have been subject to by Canada, and learning about justice, equity, structures of power, and to imagine how to build social relations for a different world. We affirm our solidarity with the Indigenous peoples of this land, working towards their self-determination and sovereignty from settler colonialism. Okay, so this is the Belfour Lecture. The Belfour name is actually a big name in surgery. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, the retractor that uh, general surgeons are familiar with, the Belfour Retractor. But who was Donald Church Belfour? Well, he was born in Toronto, hence our ability to capture his name for one of our named lectureships. He went to the University of Toronto Medical School, 1906. He worked as a house surgeon in Hamilton, but then was recruited to Mayo Clinic in Rochester in Minnesota, 1908. He was very clever. He married into the Mayo family. He married Carolyn Mayo. He became head of surgery at Mayo in 1912, professor of surgery at the Mayo Foundation, 1920, president of the American College of Surgeons, uh, perhaps the, uh, the biggest position or job in all of surgery in the United States in 1935, director of the Mayo Foundation, 1937, he retired in 1947. So uh, just so you know, for many years, um, there was a fund in the Department of Surgery that lay kind of fallow was not uh, being utilized and it was named the Belfour Fund. And I did a little bit of digging and when uh, Karen was interested in promoting a lecture in surgical ethics, I thought this would be a great reason and need to use the funding from the Belfour Fund. And that's what we've done. So over the years, we've hosted several lectures. You can see the names here, Charles Bosk, Martin McNeely, Mark Siegler, and last year, Marcy Bowers is just the name of a few that we've had and they've, they've been great lectureships. I've always enjoyed them and Karen's done a great job at bringing very interesting, um, riveting topics forward for us. So um, I wanna say a big thanks to not only Karen, who's uh, shown here in this image, but also Martin McNeely because the two of them worked together over the years to really bring surgical ethics to the forefront in our department and now we have a pathway for uh, surgeon ethicists to be promoted in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto level, thanks to the work that both Martin and Karen have done. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program back over to uh, Karen so that she can introduce uh, Rob and Marie. Okay, Karen. Unmute. Start again. Uh, thank you so much. This is a great attendance and thank you for the kind words, um, Dr. Rutka. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce uh, Dr. Marie Fonan is a respirologist and clinical investigator at St. Michael's Hospital and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. She completed her MD at Université de Montréal as well as her internal medicine training and then came to Toronto for her fellowship in respirology and eventually a master's in clinical epidemiology. She's the director of the Toronto HHT Center, a multidisciplinary center for patients and families with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, and she is passionate about advancing care for people with HHT a rare, and rare disease, and recently led the International HHT Guidelines. Um, also a pleasure to introduce Dr. Stewart, um, who completed his undergraduate studies in psychology and then an MD degree at Queen's University. He then did two years of general surgery training at Queen's and ultimately transferred to UFT to enter the urology training program. During that time, he did the SSTP program. And upon completion of his urology training in Toronto, he spent two years at Harvard Medical School as an oncology fellow. 
He then returned to Toronto with his wife, Margaret, and a new baby, Sarah, to start their careers at UHN in 1997. Um, two years later, Dr. Stewart relocated to St. Michael's Hospital one week after welcoming twin sons to the family. He currently works as urolo urologic surgeon specialing, specializing in GU cancer and renal transplant at St. Michael's Hospital and has developed a keen interest in surgical education and is, in the, is the recipient of multiple teaching awards, including the U of T Department of Surgery Bruce Tovey Award for undergraduate teaching and the Tovey Award for postgraduate teaching. He served as the urology program director for 10 years and has served on the Royal College Examination Committee, is the undergraduate surgical director for the Fitzgerald Academy, and as a member of the undergraduate med medical education committee. Um, Margaret and Rob continue their work at U of T Faculty of Medicine with pride and optimism. So um, on that note, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, let me unmute. Uh, can you hear me, firstly? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good to yes. go. Okay, great. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to share these thoughts with you today. Uh, Dr. Rutka asked me to be the Balfour lecturer oh, some months ago, I guess, and I was absolutely excited to do so. And I'm really glad today that Marie can be here uh, with me so that we can show both sides of this story that we've experienced together, uh, a donor, a recipient. And I wanna focus mostly actually on this other issue of the physician as patient. Um, Marie and I are really happy uh, to be here today and hopefully pr to provoke some discussion about a topic that is under the radar screen often and not talked about or written about often. Uh, and that is that of the physician as patient. And having said that, our faculty recently lost two outstanding individuals who had the courage to share at the end of their lives, their personal experiences with being a physician patient. Doctors Rob Sargent and Fred Gentili will be sadly missed. Their candor sets the stage to bring this topic into sharper focus for conversation and hopefully continued progress. Dr. Rutka has introduced Dr. Balfour, and so I uh, need to uh, say little more, uh, apart from the fact that that Balfour retractor still lives today and is used for pelvic surgery uh, widely. Uh, curiously, it has found a place in a study that we're doing uh, with the transplant uh, kidneys at St. Michael's Hospital, uh, looking at in vivo assessment of fibrosis through photoacoustic imaging, and the Balfour retractor blades just seem to hold the ultrasound probe so tightly and securely uh, because there's ultrasound being done on the back table and then again in the patient after the uh, vessels uh, have been unclamped and uh, the graft is in situ. And uh, I, I don't think Dr. Balfour would ever have envisaged uh, his invention as being used for this purpose, but I don't think he would have minded either. So with that, uh, let me proceed with uh, uh, my comments about the physician as patient, the wounded healer, and thank you again for the introduction. In this story, there, 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 is, an, there is an overstory, uh, which are the transparent events that uh, happened between March of 2018 uh, and June of 2019. And it's important that I uh, provide some of that background to contextualize what I really want to talk about today, which is the understory, the experiences and perceptions of the physician as a patient, and how it can change us both personally and professionally. Rob, I'm not sure if others are, are seeing your slides. I know you have slides now. Um, I'm not seeing them. So I just wanted to interrupt before we went any further. Okay, thank you. Um, you have to share them again. I, I th Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. So I will... Uh, Okay, so uh, this uh, story really begins in March of 2018. Can you see my slides now? 
Great. Okay. And uh, my daughter was at McGill University. She was a third year student in arts, uh, studying politics. And apparently, at least she told us, it was very uh, common to have a term away, some uh, place uh, interesting. And uh, she wanted to study uh, international politics uh, in Singapore. And uh, so she did. And it happened that her March break uh, uh, was coming up. And uh, my wife, Margaret, uh, who is an ICU doctor at UHN, was on call that week and, and couldn't travel. And I thought, well, maybe I should just go along to Singapore and make sure that Sarah's ensconced uh, well uh, within her program and in living safely, et cetera. And so I went over to have sort of a father-daughter uh, week uh, in, in Singapore. And I hadn't been there for about 15 years, but I have to tell you that much has changed. And uh, it is uh, such a modern city now with all this wild architecture that's uh, so beautiful. And the city is actually very immaculate and clean, et cetera. And we spent the first day, I mean, I must tell you that the city looks as you drive in from the airport as if it was just unpackaged for your arrival. Um, so we spent a day looking at her university and where she was living, et cetera. And, and then I said, well, what do you want to do for the rest of the week, Sarah? And she said, well, dad, you know, we're not staying in Singapore. We're going to Bangkok. And I thought, well, okay, a change of plans. Interesting. Um, I said, you know, I'll get two hotel rooms in Bangkok, I'll make all the plane reservations, and then we'll uh, go there and I'll take care of everything. Uh, and so we go to Bangkok. And um, Bangkok is fascinating uh, for those who, uh, who have visited. Um, there, there is this exquisite uh, uh, palace and a number of uh, temples, etc. There's there's so much to see and do there. And along the river, there are all of these floating markets uh, that Bangkok is famous for. And this is a picture of one of the first, I think the first floating market, just a little snapshot of what is a huge market, actually. And it dates back to, I think, the early 1860s. And uh, you can see that commerce happens between these thin little boats. And uh, this woman in this picture is passing a piece of fruit to a, a boat beside her, et cetera. And it's all done with precision and finesse. And it's really something to see. And I thought the juxtaposition of this uh, antiquated market from the 1860s with modern iPhone technology, taking a picture of it uh, was interesting. And so, you know, I said to Sarah, I'll take care of everything. I have only one question for you. And that was, can you get us a ride on an elephant? And uh, within a nanosecond, she said, dad, you can't do that. That's animal abuse. And I said, after contemplating for a moment, can you ride a horse? And she said, yes. But she said, you cannot ride an elephant. I didn't question further. She said, I'll take you to this elephant sanctuary and you can pet their trunk and you can feed them and you'll have fun actually. So be a good sport and let's do this and I'll take care of it. And she hired a driver and a car and everything. And we drove outside of Bangkok seemingly endlessly. I, it just went on forever it seemed uh, to this elephant sanctuary. And on the way uh, there was a stop at a food market and this little food fruit market was on the outskirts of Bangkok. Um, it seemed like it was in the middle of the jungle. I, I didn't know how anyone would go there um, of their own volition. I mean, it was truly in the middle of nowhere. And yet we stopped there and the driver said, this is where we buy elephant food. And I said, well, what is elephant food? And he said, uh, well, that's corn and bananas. And that didn't sound too exotic to me. And so I, th I thought, Sarah, this is simple. We'll split it up. You get the corn, I'll get the bananas. We'll rendezvous back here in five minutes and we'll go on to the elephant sanctuary. So I'm wandering around this outdoor market, which is really on, on the edge of a jungle somewhere outside of the city. And um, uh, I come across this low slung table with slats painted green and piled with bananas. And I thought, bingo, this is elephant food. And so I stuck my hand into this giant pile of bananas. And like most people, uh, consumers, uh, when they go to the supermarket, they reach deep into the pile looking for possibly the fresher produce as if the elephants would have cared one whit. But I did that. Uh, and while I had my hand in this uh, pile of bananas, I felt this chomp on my hand right between my thumb and index finger in that web space. Um, 
of my dominant hand and I pulled it out. And what I saw were five holes in my hand, uh, bite marks. And I immediately uh, Googled uh, this picture and realized that if you have two holes in your uh, skin, uh, that may be a viper. And you know maybe you're going to die or something like that. But if you have five holes in your skin, it's very likely to be a non-venomous bite. And so I made this quick decision that given that I was going home the next day anyway, I would deal with whatever eventuality happened, having convinced myself that this is probably not a viper's bite and that I wasn't going to die. And I certainly didn't want to spend my last afternoon in an ER in Bangkok. So we went on to the elephant place. So, you know, this snake uh, thing, uh, I didn't see the face of the snake that bit me, but I saw it slither out the backside of this table from this pile of bananas and it was gray and it was big. It looked like this snake. It was maybe six to eight centimeters in diameter and probably two to three meters long. Um, but it just slithered away off into the jungle. And, and uh, so we went our merry way, I suppose, and got to this elephant sanctuary. And, and this is a picture of Sarah feeding the elephant. And it's curious that the corn and the bananas go in uh, different ways. Uh, the bananas you stuff in the end of their trunk and they snort it like almost like cocaine or something like that. And if you, if you put your hand on the ventrum of, of the elephant's trunk, you can feel the, the banana go by like a missile. It's really quite uh, astounding. And the corn, of course, you just put sideways into their mouth and they eat it husk and all, and they could do this all day. And, and Sarah and I could have done it all day as well. It was really a lot of fun and we had a, a good time uh, on that occasion. So that was the day of March the 8th. Uh, snake bite, yeah, likely not venomous. Uh, that was, I guess, my presumption, uh, and I would deal with it the next day when I got back to Toronto. And overall, we had a, a very nice time. And I was going back the next morning anyway, but it's a 21 hour flight. And by the end of 21 hours on the plane, I was clearly getting sick, not venomous sick, uh, but rather kind of infectious sick. Um, uh, I, I felt distinctly unwell when I got off the plane and I went to work the next day and saw a plastic surgeon at our place and I had a temp of 40 and I had cellulitis that extended from my fingertips right up to my shoulder and uh, I was, uh, they, they investigated the wound a little bit looking for a retained fang or something like that, but felt that my tendons were infected and put me in plaster and, and prescribed Keflex, which all of it seemed, you know, uh, a good idea. Um, and I, I was uh, happy with that plan and we went forward. So three days later, uh, the cellulitis, because the tips of my fingers were exposed from the plaster, it was clearly not getting better and I was still febrile. And so like a very good patient, I just chopped the cast off uh, to confirm. And uh, I got an opinion from a tropical disease expert at UHN who said, Rob, I don't know what lives in the mouth of a Bangkok snake, but I think you need to ramp up the antibiotics. And so he prescribed uh, a mox clav. And uh, after several days, I must say, the cellulitis was regressing very well. Um, but on day five or six, I can't remember exactly, but I, I woke up with a wicked rash uh, all over my trunk and back. And it seemed like a drug eruption. I stopped the antibiotics and I was told that this would get better. It's you know, probably just a drug allergy. But over the course of weeks, it wasn't getting better actually. And uh, then I was told that worse problems might include serum sickness or maybe even possibly Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So Stevens-Johnson syndrome is actually what it was or what it came to be. And uh, my experience with that was a rash over my tummy and chest and back and onto my limbs. And it lasted two months. Um, I had shaking chills, like sort of uh, rigors each day and drenching night sweats every day for almost 10 months. And I was told that, you know, Stevens Johnson syndrome would probably, you know, go away if I was patient uh, and it would might take six or eight months uh, to resolve. Um, I sloughed all the skin around my lips and my mouth, uh, which is very typical of this uh, entity. And I had arthralgias in my small joints, in my fingers, my wrists, et cetera, 
But the most salient feature of this experience was this profound fatigue. I would come home from work each day and uh, I could eat a bit of dinner and then I just had to go to bed. I had no energy for anything. And this went on for months and months. And I had my fingers crossed thinking, you know, I, I was told it might take months to get better and I, I'm hopeful, but eventually I became not so optimistic. Uh, now, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is something that we were all taught about in medical school and it was described a hundred years ago. It's fairly rare, but can be serious. And, and many times it's only very localized to skin and mucous membranes, uh, as I just uh, uh, mentioned. And it's usually a reaction to medications. And one of the uh, bad uh, actors in this have historically been sulfonamides. And I think for a period of time, and maybe even today still, sulfonamides may be non-formulary in the UK as a result of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and their association with it. But there have been many other uh, antibiotics that have been implicated in this entity and a number of anticonvulsants as well. And so the pediatric ep epilepsy population uh, have some experience with Stevens-Johnson syndrome in response to anticonvulsant uh, treatment of, the, of these children. And as I mentioned earlier, it's usually self-limited, but I was aware that there can be cases of end organ damage. Um, very occasionally, we see uh, in the kidney transplant program, patients who have lost their kidney function as, as a result of systemic effects of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, but usually it affects GI and lung uh, most commonly. I was told uh, that high dose steroids and plasma phoresis were available and, you know, possible uh, strategies here, but of limited value and maybe not worth the downside risk. So the diagnosis, SJS or Stevens-Johnson, I had it for sure, full on. And, you know, in my research, I found that there have been multiple cases of this entity in response to a MOX clav that I received, and some of them have gone on to uh, hepatic uh, disease. These are not pictures of me, but this is exactly what happened. Uh, the sloughing of the skin around the lips and the inside of my mouth fell off. And, uh, you, you know, I'm a bit of a chili head and I like spicy food, but all food, even the blandest of food, tasted so spicy that I could barely eat. Um, and I had these target lesions on my trunk that eventually sort of coalesced into a confluent rash. Um, and still all of the other systemic side effects that I mentioned earlier persisted. But this was a, very much a part of what I experienced in the early couple of months. So that just brings you to a point where you can understand what was happening to me over the course of several months after this incident in March. And now I really wanna to get to that understory part of things about the physician patient. And we're reminded of comments uh, from William Osler about how the good physician treats the disease and the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And as a physician patient, I would submit that illness can often challenge our equanimity. When a physician becomes a patient, boundaries can become blurred and often do become blurred. And a very dangerous situation is when care starts to be driven by the physician patient. And of course, you know, we're all very similar. Uh, we don't like to sit in the passenger seat. We're used to sitting in the driver's seat. We're used to turning the dials and steering the vehicle. And so uh, when care is driven by the physician patient, I can tell you that the wheels can come off. Um, and finally, and this is not an inclusive list, but these are things that come to my mind, assumptions that are made can affect care. And those assumptions are often made by the uh, uh, physician who's treating the physician patient, um, assumptions that they know more than they really do, talking above them, uh, not wanting to sound condescending, not wanting to treat them like every other patient they see on a day-to-day -day basis. So assumptions of, of, of knowledge that may not be present, et cetera. And this can potentially affect care uh, in a negative fashion. So fast forward, uh, we started in March of that year. Now we're November and this situation is just not going away, frankly. Uh, and at that point, I spoke to my surgeon in chief and said, uh, you know, uh, please, I, I need a, uh, to take a leave of absence and pursue a diagnosis. Uh, this is really not going away. It's, in fact, it was getting worse. Uh, and so at that point, I had one day at Women's College Hospital and spent uh, the day with a, uh, 
a fantastic general internal medicine doctor who ordered, I, I can't say, maybe a hundred tubes of blood, it seemed. And I was imaged from the top of my head uh, to my toes. I had CT scans, regular imaging, ultrasounds, Doppler studies, et cetera. At the end of that day, she came back to see me and she said, Rob, um, I don't know really what to say, but this Stevens Johnson syndrome has wrecked your liver and I'm sending you to the transplant clinic tomorrow. So that hit me like an anvil between the eyes, I must tell you. I, I mean, I didn't see this coming. It was not on my radar screen at all. I knew I wasn't getting better, but there it was. Uh, and it just happened in an instant. Um, and so I went to the transplant clinic and they're really straight up folks. I mean, you know, they, they spoke to me very frankly from the beginning and right through. And they said, find a donor. Uh, because if you don't get a donor, you'll probably be on this deceased donor list, but we're going to list you for it. But it may take one or two years before you're sick enough uh, to get a deceased donor liver. And it's possible that if that happens, you, you'll never work again. And so I left that appointment with this feeling that I'd been spoken to very honestly and truthfully and in a very upright fashion, but I was just reeling uh, because this happened so quickly. And how does one even begin to find a live liver donor? And you might ask, you know, Rob, I mean, you're a transplant surgeon. You've been doing this with kidneys for over 20 years. How can you not know the answer to that? And the fact of the matter is that we actually meet patients who come to kidney transplantation very close to the end of their journey. They've already been through this process of finding a donor if they have a live donor, and they're counseled by transplant coordinators, et cetera. And we as surgeons kind of parachute in at the last minute and talk to them about their surgical candidacy and uh, risks and benefits of the operation they're about to undertake. And so I really didn't have a lot of experience about how to begin this process of finding a, an organ donor for myself. So there was no clear algorithm in my mind, and I didn't really know where to start. But I was given some very good advice by the surgical director of multi-organ transplant at UHN who said, you cannot advocate for yourself like it's really awkward. You can't ask somebody for a liver. And I got that immediately. And he said, also, it makes people very uncomfortable to be asked for a portion of their liver. And that kind of resonated with me. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, I'll get back to you on that one. Um, he said, you need somebody who can advocate for you. And in this instance, uh, my wife, Margaret, stepped up and she became my advocate. And I'm eternally grateful for all the work that she did in that regard, because Marg uh, and I have friends, you know, around the world, and a lot of them in Europe and places that have huge uh, time differences. And Margaret was on her laptop at 430 every morning for months and months and months, uh, not asking for a liver. No, uh, she was simply telling the story, uh, explaining to people what had happened to me uh, and uh, advocating in that sort of soft way uh, that is probably more comfortable uh, for both sides. Um, and uh, again, I, I was very grateful that she was able to do that on my behalf. On my end, it, it was this frustratingly opaque process. And, and I tell you that because it's, it's absolutely true. And I understand it. I understand the need for anonymity between donors and recipients. They have to be separated because you can imagine that a potential donor at the last minute could have a cumulative attack of the willies and say, I can't do this. And the program would simply say to the recipient, and the donor is not known to the recipient at that point, well, we, we had a donor and that person wasn't appropriate and nothing more is ever said. And so this need for anonymity protects both sides and I get it completely, but when you have to live it, it is excruciating. And so the analogy that I use, because I didn't know whether there were zero or two or 100 people who had come forward to be a donor, uh, they don't tell you that. And the analogy that I think about often is this running of a race whereby your doctors are cheering you on, cheerleading you from the sidelines saying, keep running, keep running. We'll let you know when something happens. But frankly, you don't know where the finish line is. And it is really frustrating to keep running that race when you don't know where it will end. I, I was too sick to work and I was 
too sick to drive even at that time. So all I could do really was walk and climb. And I sort of internalized this idea that if I ever got a liver transplant, I was going to run to the operating room. I was not going to be wheeled on a gurney. And so I walked every day and it was through the winter, you know, between November and, and, and later. Uh, and so I, I, I learned that underground uh, path uh, un, under uh, downtown Toronto and from Dundas to Union, Union Station, I walked that back and forth every day um, uh, relentlessly. And I climbed 15 flights of stairs every day with this idea that I would be in the best possible shape to receive a liver if one became available. And during that time, you know, of course, uh, lots of intruding thoughts. I wasn't really speaking to anybody. I was just walking and climbing. And I, I started to think about how doctors feel they should never get sick. And it creates this dilemma when they do, when we do. Um, and balancing and reconciling this dual aspect of our identities as physicians and now as a patient. And what previously helped me as a doctor, believing that I was invulnerable to disease. And that is a, something that happens, I think, in medical school when we get armored up to feel this invulnerability to disease. Well, could this now possibly impede me? I was frightened. Um, I had a, an overwhelming loss of control. I was told straight up by the transplant folks that my two-year mortality rate uh, or risk on the day I met them was 50%. But when it got to be a two-month mortality risk of 50%, I'd be prioritized for deceased uh, liver. And I had never before had my life reduced to such blunt statistics. And that was very frightening. And all of this reality literally unfolded within a week. So there wasn't a lot of time to process. It was happening day by day, chunk by chunk. And I had this tremendous sense of unpreparedness and helplessness, unable to help my family and unable to help myself. The waiting room was this very uh, interesting sort of observational laboratory. Uh, we as doctors arrive in the waiting room early because we are that type. The doctor is late because we are that type. We overbook. And I looked around the waiting room and I thought, I'm not one of these people. Um, they look so sickly. For sure, I'm not one of them. But I eventually learned to be a patient. And it's a process that is still ongoing. I'm still learning to be a patient. I'm better than I was, but I'm not there yet. Uh, and I started to appreciate, as I looked around uh, this room on many, many uh, clinic visits, I started to appreciate the collective suffering within that waiting room. And that's something that was lost on me uh, previously in my own practice. You know, I would have a very busy clinic. I would pick up one chart, go to this packed waiting room, call one name, one patient would stand up and I would usher her or him to an examining room, have a clinical encounter, and then find the next patient. And I really never stopped to pause and reflect upon the collective suffering that was present in that waiting area. Everybody has their story. And when I was sitting in waiting rooms uh, for endless clinic appointments, I made up a story for every single patient I saw and saw regularly in the waiting area. So because uh, I've alluded to this idea that doctors don't talk about this very much and don't write about it very much, I had to do a, a bit of a deep dive when I started researching this concept of the physician as patient. And it led me to some of the writings of Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist who was a, a, a colleague, a, uh, or at least a, an acquaintance of Sigmund Freud, a contemporary. And uh, after Freud, I think, published uh, his seminal work, The Interpretation of Dreams in uh, 1900, um, Carl Jung read it and decided that Freud was too obsessed with sex and he needed to go in a different direction. And Jung started to write about archetypal patterns of human behavior and these archaic and mythic characters that make up archetypes that reside within all people from all over the world. And these archetypes symbolize our basic human motivations, our values, and in fact, it formed, I think, the basis of Jung's personality theory, which 
even today has tremendous heuristic value. And he wrote about 12 archetypes. And the, the four that we hear about or read about occasionally are the self, the shadow, the anima, and the animus. But he also wrote about a number of others, uh, the hero, the scholar, the lover, and the caregiver. And within this paradigm of the caregiver, he talked about the wounded healer, the title of this talk, through awareness of his or her injuries is better able to help others. So fast forward again to May of 2019. And um, by that time, I'd, I'd had some medical treatment and was feeling better. I was able to drive again. Uh, and I can tell you, I was in the parking lot of Home Depot. It was raining. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. The windshield wipers were going back and forth. And I get a telephone call from my doctor at UHN. And she said, we found a donor. And I was gobsmacked. This international search had circled back to St. Michael's Hospital. And she said, Dr. Marie Fonin, who, who I knew, uh, she's a respirologist at St. Mike's. We'd shared some patients. Uh, together in the past. And uh, as a member of respirology, the division at the university, along with my wife, Margaret, they knew each other uh, better than I knew Marie even, as they'd served on committees, etc. And Marie had initially been anonymous through the workup phase, because who knows how that's going to unfold. But after it was all said and done, and she had made a decision that she wanted to proceed, she wanted me to know that we had been connected. And so, you know, all of this came uh, just, you know, crashing down on me in an instant. And there was a date for surgery three weeks hence. And Maria and I talked a few times by telephone. And I think we met once prior to our surgery, but for sure we spoke the night before surgery. And while both of us were apprehensive, neither of us was scared. Surgery for each of us was actually completely smooth. Um, it isn't always that way for everybody, but we were really lucky. We had fantastic teams. Uh, of people uh, working uh, with us, and it was uh, brilliant. Uh, we walked the hallway together in the morning of the first post-operative day, and Marie went home at day four, and I left the day after. But this is not now about just two people, but two families and circles of friends, and it's a very complex relationship. Our families met each other in the surgical waiting area for the first time. Marie's adult uh, daughters met my three adult children, um, and uh, Margaret met Marie's husband, Chuck, in the surgical waiting area while both of us were in the operating room. Marie had made a choice, but I really had no choice to make. She was the hero of this exchange, and her family was fully behind her decision. And I truly wanted her to have the softer landing and recovery to become hers first. Marie is an avid cyclist. I, in fact, she was on a week-long cycling tour the week before the surgery in Spain with a bunch of guys. And uh, you know, she can cycle with the best of them. I, I know that. And Marie's around my age, I think maybe a bit younger. And I asked myself, why did she step forward? Why, why does any potential donor step forward? And many did, as I ultimately learned. I didn't know that initially, but I learned through the course of time that many, many people did step forward. But why did she? And I think it's because she asked not, why me? Why should I do this? But rather, why not me? And I started thinking a lot about who are these people who consent to the most altruistic of all surgery, who enter the hospital well and are discharged sick? Is there a phenotype of an organ donor? Is there some anatomic substrate of altruism? Well, curiously, there is some evidence that organ donors possess a unique phenotype with larger amygdalas than the rest of us. Uh, this was based on a study of uh, MR uh, images of the brain in organ donors and age match controls, a group from Pennsylvania published this. And the amygdala is obviously a, a, you know, a, a very primitive part of our brain that may contribute to ideas of 
caring, feeling, wanting to make life altering change for another. So this was really interesting to learn that there is possibly some kind of anatomic substrate for this you know, obtuse concept of altruism. And this same group uh, is now looking at cognitive processing studies of donors, and that is a subject of ongoing work. So what has changed for me? I think really hard about what we ask of our patients. You know, I thought nothing historically of checking off requisitions for CT scans, ultrasounds, nuclear medicine, imaging, blood work, et cetera, and just saying, you know, we'll get all this organized for you and then I'll see you after we get the results. But what we're asking of patients is a lot. And I now try as hard as I can to streamline all of their studies into one day, if possible, because a lot of these people come from outside of Toronto and as often as not, they're being driven to these appointments by children who have taken time off work, maybe unpaid time off work, because I learned through my own experience that being critically ill was a full-time job. The other thing that uh, really resonates with me is that with my hand on the doorknob of these little four by eight foot examining rooms that we have clinical encounters in with patients, I now try to look over my shoulder into the patient's face at the end of this encounter to try to convince myself that their agenda has been completely met. And if I can't convince myself of that, I'm completely prepared to sit down and continue the conversation. I do now consider myself a patient, an evolving patient, I guess, like everyone else in the waiting room every time I enter that room. When we try to give doctors special care, we deviate from our training and protocol. We make mistakes, we make assumptions, and for sure, we underestimate severity. Throwing years of judgment and wisdom out the window to go the extra mile for a colleague thinking that we're doing them a favor, is it fair to wonder, is that extra mile too far? I'm as vulnerable as any of them. I'm just one fortunate person in a cohort of transplant survivors, and I fully appreciate now, in a way that I didn't before, the collective suffering when I look into the waiting room. Each patient has a story and often more frightening than my own. You know, a doctor's emotional circuits can fry as fast as anyone else's and regularly become saturated. It's possible that doctors may need more support than a patient who's never set foot in a hospital. I had these kind of overarching questions about the program uh, afterwards, you know, like, will I ever work again? Uh, will I be functional, even with a good outcome by their metrics? Um, what does follow-up look like? And am I now part of a program that's bigger than my life? I must say that I had fully internalized our medical mantra, this one of push, push harder, push even harder. You know, our medical mantra is not conducive to healing oneself. Compassion and empathy for my patients came naturally and was real as it does for all of you who look after patients but I regarded illness in myself as a weakness. And I think at times we regard illness in our colleagues as weakness in a way that we don't see our patients. And I would submit that we as doctors need to give ourselves permission, permission to experience illness as we do for our patients. Marie gave half of her liver, it regenerated within about 12 or 16 weeks and she has a completely functional liver. The piece of her liver that she gave me also regenerated, maybe a bit more slowly because of the drugs, but now I have a completely functional liver. Uh, and this is not a new concept. I mean, the ancient Greeks knew that this was possible because we remember the story of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods. And as a result, his punishment was to be chained to the top of Mount Olympus. And he was visited by crows who pecked out his liver and it would regenerate and they would visit him again for eternity. And that was his punishment. It's curious that the liver is a very immune privileged organ. It's very much unlike um, kidneys, the heart, the lungs. In that 15 to 20% of adults can actually come off all immune suppression with time. 
you know, doctors who get sick have uniquely been on both sides of the stethoscope or the scalpel or however you want to um, um, uh, talk about it, but it, it's all about having this unique double lens of being on both sides, these dual roles of being the observer and being observed. On countless occasions, I took my white coat off and traded it in for a blue gown and stripped bare in examining rooms. Facing this threat of death, confronting my view of myself, my role, my interactions with my patients and my colleagues, and all of these hierarchies, as I alluded to before, that, are, that armor us up in medical school uh, were turned upside down, and not gradually in my case, but in an instant because it happened so quickly. Not all wounds affect one equally, nor does any particular wound move all individuals in the same way. I think about that often, and we need to meet people where they're at. People think you can't be affected by disease as a physician because you cure disease. I used to wonder at some point in my life how doctors could die except by accident. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't die by accident, well, we'll all be patients at some time in our lives. My colleagues and I are reluctant, I fear, to reveal our issues if we're patients ourselves. And we need to accept the possibility of disease in a very non-judgmental way so that we can apply the best medical care to our colleagues. A caregiver doesn't need to be wounded to be informed, just open-minded. And something I think about often, and I'm not sure I really understand it completely, but I ask myself, is empathy a skill or an attitude? What is it that we acquire and what is innate? Maria and I had the opportunity to publish our perspectives as a donor and recipient in the CMAJ in June of 2020, which was just over a year after the surgery. And this picture, uh, which was appended uh, to the uh, piece, was taken by Marie's husband, Chuck, uh, who's a great photographer, actually. And, uh, and this is the uh, cityscape of Toronto in the background. And uh, this was taken on uh, Broadview, uh, looking over Riverdale Park. And this is the beginning of the pandemic. And at that time, we weren't uh, wearing masks outdoors, but we were uh, with this idea of social distancing. And because Marie's bike figured so prominently in her lifestyle and her decision to donate, uh, we decided that we would distance across the length of Marie's bike. Um, so uh, this is my penultimate slide. Uh, I have uh, gratitude for so many people uh, and I'll start from the bottom up. Uh, all these people who came forward as potential donors, including all of my family. Um, and I only came to know of so many of these people who came forward after the fact, because uh, for reasons that I described earlier, uh, you're not told at the time in real time. Uh, I'm grateful to my patients who taught me to understand their grief better than I had ever fully understood previously. And I'm extremely grateful to the doctors, nurses, and, and uh, allied health professionals at UHN who provided exemplary care to both Marie and myself. Very much uh, emphatically to Margaret and my family, uh, both immediate and extended, without whom I would not be back working as a surgeon. And finally, to Marie, uh, with the support of her family, and they were tremendously supportive of her decision to do this, and they're the reason I'm alive. A final thought, we're designed, we're actually designed to be organ donors. It's profound, and it's a privilege. Going forward, the medical school has approached regarding implementing this topic of physician as patient into both undergraduate and postgraduate curricula. And I am absolutely so excited to pursue this and uh, have had meetings with postgraduate and undergraduate leads as well as the acting dean. It's a multifaceted topic for sure. It's not just about the physician who has a health problem and becomes a patient. It can be about Marie the physician who voluntarily becomes a patient. It can be about the patient who ultimately becomes a physician 
uh, as a result of their own personal experiences. And it could be about this very huge topic of the physician with mental health issues and wellness and how all of this interdigitates. Uh, so the foundation, foundational pillars of this curriculum are very much in place. And there's a need for mentors and facilitators because these will necessarily be small group sessions, intimate and interactive. It can't be a, um, a, a lecture in front of the entire medical school class. And so as we explore this very timely aspect of medical education, we're looking for faculty members with an interest in this topic and possibly with something to share from their own experience. But as I mentioned earlier, one doesn't have to be wounded to be informed, only open-minded. And if you have interest in this curriculum at either the undergraduate or postgraduate level, I would urge you, I would implore you to contact me at this email address. And I've left, uh, left my cell phone number here as well, because we want to get this integrated into the curriculum. We'll study it, we'll publish it, and we hope to get uptake from other medical schools in Canada and beyond. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And thank you, uh, Jim uh, and Karen for inviting me uh, to give this. I'm excited to hear Marie's comments and I'll turn the mic over um, to Marie at this point. Thank you again. Thanks, Rob. I'm gonna get set up um, with my talk here. Just give me one second. Can you see my slides okay? Okay, great. So thank you. It's a real pleasure to be giving this talk and, and I'm really honored to be invited. I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous, um, not only because of this distinguished audience, but also to be talking about, um, I'm really talking about a personal experience. So it's a little different than the usual, usual talks I give about HHD and research, et cetera, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to be here to do so. So as you know, um, it, it really all started with Rob and Marg. So I learned that, that Rob was terribly ill and that he needed a liver to survive. And Marg, also my colleague and friend, um, and Marg was also my colleague and friend. And, and both, are, both I knew were outstanding, caring doctors. They had patients who needed them and they had a family who needed them. And I think that for all of these reasons, that, uh, and a few others that I'm gonna talk about, their story really resonated with me. And, and you know, first of all, it reminded me of my colleague, Jay Yang, who passed away almost 10 years ago. And Jay, um, uh, Jay had leukemia, and I think he might've survived if he had had a better match for a donor, but it wasn't possible to find one. I also had at the time that, that Rob was sick, um, I had a young nephew who had, had recurrent leukemia and who needed a donor. Um, and, and, uh, and this obviously, you know, all of these things were weighing on my mind. I also, I, as I mentioned earlier, or as was mentioned in my intro, I look after people with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia or HHT, and sometimes those patients need a liver transplant. So it also was sort of part of my work life that I had advocated for people to get liver transplants. And I had seen patients struggling through finding or waiting for a donor. On a completely other track, I had a few other reasons um, why, you know, why Rob's story stopped me in my tracks. Well, first of all, for, for too many years already, my New Year's resolution had been to try to make the world a kinder place, and it, it was still on my list. Um, also, I, I have to say, I, I've, I've really been, I've truly been lucky in health, um, and, and, and I realize that, and I am grateful I was feeling grateful for my health and also grateful that I have a healthy family and friends. And I have this, actually this amazing group of friends that challenge me, my, my cycling friends that challenge me and, and keep me healthy. And as you heard about that, that year I was training to go on, on a big bike trip with them, bigger than any bike trip I'd ever been on before. And then finally, you know, maybe as a doctor, maybe the process didn't sound or didn't seem as scary to me. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but to me, that was, you know, as a doctor, I had the privilege of being able to, to, to ask people for information. And I was able to, in fact, reach out to a good friend who was, who was in the know, so to speak. Um, in fact, this good friend is, um, one of my cycling friends is Gonzalo Saposotian, who's one of the liver transplant surgeons. So, so one day in March, I, after kind of this had been 
stewing at the back of my head, I, I sent him a message out of nowhere, pretty much, and said, Gonzalo, what's it like to be a liver donor? Is it, is it really risky? Is it a long recovery? Um, I had a bunch of questions for him like that. And I'm not sure if he knew at first where I was asking these questions from, but, but we met up for coffee. Um, and, um, and, you know, after hearing him talk about what the process was and sort of the physiology of liver recovery, and, and also the, the amazing experience of the Toronto um, Live um, Donor Program um, and the amazing outcomes that they've had, it, it started to sound um, manageable. It started to sound like something that, that I could consider. And this kind of led to chapter two. Why, why not? <laughs> why, why shouldn't I be a liver donor? Why shouldn't I go forward with this idea? And, and I was, you know, there were a lot of things I was worried about when I was deciding. I, I was wondering whether it was an irresponsible thing to do. Um, I was going to miss a lot of work, maybe. Um, I have patients, I have lots of people counting on me. Um, and here I was going to, on purpose, um, make myself sick and miss work. And, and uh, that I wasn't sure if that was an irresponsible thing to do. And maybe it was foolish to throw away good health too. Um, and maybe it would be too scary for my family. You know, um, you've heard about my husband and I have two daughters as well. And they were teenagers at the time. And I thought, and I wasn't really sure how they would feel about this. In fact, when I first told my husband, I was thinking about it, we were having dinner out and we were having a lively conversation, the two of us. And then I, you know, eventually sort of mentioned to him that I was thinking about this and it just was a complete conversation stop, <laughs> a killer. Um, he didn't say another word for the rest of the night. So I, I think it was actually a little scary. Um, eventually he came around to talking about it again and, and he was hugely supportive of me doing this, but it was a scary thing for him. And so, and, you know, and, you know, and, was this just a crazy idea I was having? Um, I, you know, I, I, worry, I, I just wasn't sure how, you know, how crazy of an idea it was. And, and I thought, you know, on, and, and another track, I, I also worried on the long list of things I was worrying about as I was trying to decide was, what if things didn't go well for, for my friend after transplant? How, how would I manage that? How would, how would that feel? And, um, so all of these things were sort of spinning around in my head. Um, and, you know, a lot of them were things I needed to talk about to, to know how to answer those questions. But probably, like, practically speaking, I started to think about, okay, all the things I was worried about really could go in three buckets. Um, all the commitments that I had that I was worried about, they went in three buckets. That one was a bucket of things that I just needed to reach out and ask people for help with. Um, like coverage and clinic, et cetera, that most, many of the work things. The second was the bucket of things I needed to make my peace with, like going to our um, international HHT conference in Puerto Rico that summer, that is something I'd been working towards and my sort of a favorite event to interact with my colleagues, but maybe I could make my peace with going to that. Um, and then the third bucket was the things that I needed to work around, things I needed to find a way to do anyway, even if I did go ahead with this. And, you know, many of those things that in that third, that third bucket were really things like family, family events and trips, which, you know, were small problems, but things that were really important to me. Um, and, you know, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about my daughters, they're both very athletic and, um, and I'm their number one fan. Um, and so it was, it's so important to me to share with their big moments or big saves here. Here's Annie as a, as a goalkeeper. Um, and, and also there's Clara, my older daughter, this was her first, one of her first races on the national sailing team. So to me, you know, being, being there for these, um, these big events and big moments is super important, but, but also even, you know, probably even, even more important, especially was to be there on the hard days. Um, and, and we had some of those events coming up and they were, you know, and, and the big one, one of the big ones is that Clara was going to the world championships in Japan. So that was a really important thing to me to try and figure out how could this all be done and could I still make it to Japan and, and could, you know, could I keep my commitments to my family? These are the things I didn't worry about though. I didn't worry about the quality of care or the expertise of the surgeons. I felt really, you know, once I had that initial conversation with Gonzalo and he shared some some articles with me, I felt really confident in the surgical, the surgical part of the process. I also didn't worry about whether I would recover. I thought just not really a question of whether I'm gonna recover or not. It's just a question of how long it's gonna take and how long till I can get back on my bike. Um, 
I also didn't have to worry about whether I would still have a job after and whether I could afford the time off. And in other words, my, my situation was, was a privileged situation, being a doctor, financially comfortable, having all the supports in the world. And that made the decision easier and the whole process easier for me. There were some scary parts along the way. I remember when I heard that the surgery was seven to eight hours long, that I felt like a pain in my chest when I heard that. I was like, that's a really long surgery. <laughs> as, a, as an internist, um, that sounds like a long time to be in the OR. Um, and, and I was picturing my husband waiting all that time. That sounded scary to me. Um, the other thing that was scary to me was talking to Rob and Mark about it for the first time because um, I just, and, and talking to people at work about it because I really, I had been so focused on making the decision. I kind of hadn't really thought at all what it was going to be like to tell people about it. And I was really, I was really unprepared for the big emotions and, and a bit overwhelmed. Um, it was, it was, you know, it, it was all, it was all good stuff. It was wonderful, but it was a bit overwhelming and I, and I hadn't really thought that part through. So just a few more slides um, about the lovely things that happened after I decided and then how things unfolded. So um, this is a picture, um, this is a picture of my division, um, just as a, a starting point of the long list of people that really wanted to help once they heard this is what I was gonna do. Once I decided, everyone wanted to help. I remember I was so worried about all the stuff at work and within about a minute, it all evaporated because everyone was like, what can we do? How can we help? I'll take your clinic, I'll do this. And it was, it was all the, my fellow respirologists, but also my other coworkers and colleagues were really, really kind of blew me away. Everyone um, wanted to, everyone, just like me wanted to help wanted to help Rob and and that made the process so much easier and so suddenly all those commitments I were worrying about were really easy to manage so how did it all unfold well first of all I got to go on the bike trip because it was the week before the the day the surgeons wanted to do the surgery that they set the June 5th so that was lovely <laughs> I got to go on my first European bike trip and that was really special and these are all my friends and you can actually see uh, friend Gonzalo right there in the group as well. So he, uh, he, was, he was really our host in, in Spain. It was really a spectacular trip. Um, and so that was, uh, so I, I had this very fun, satisfying sort of feeling top of, top of my fitness uh, week before heading into the surgery. And that felt really good. And then the surgery itself, as you heard um, already went really well and it wasn't, it wasn't as long as it could have been. And I was home within a few days and I got to know the couch over the next couple of weeks. Everyone else in my family knows the couch and I never really knew it, but I do now. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of fun actually, I, you know, chilled. <laughs> so that was, that was, uh, that was good. Um, there were some scary parts as, as I had mentioned before, for me, I'd been scared about the length of the surgery. And, and the way that actually unfolded is that, you know, it was long for Chuck, for my husband, but, but it was nice because he met Rob's family. Um, and then funny story, I think Chuck's favorite story about the whole thing is that when the surgeon, when my surgeon came out, he, he didn't immediately tell Chuck that I was okay. Instead, he talked sort of happily for quite a long time about all the technical aspects of the surgery. <laughs> and Chuck, after waiting seven hours, was like, but did she make it? <laughs> you know, he, so that was his sort of his, his uh, most painful moment. There were a couple of other funny things um, that, that sort of are, are, are part of the story of how it unfolded. And I don't know that I've really told anyone this story before, but you know, one of the other commitments I had um, that I had been worrying about was I had committed to, to go to a yoga retreat with my sister-in-law, the mom of my nephew who had leukemia. And this was sort of a, a very, something very special for her. And it, it happened to be like the day, you know, it turned out that we had booked it way ahead, but it was going to be like the day after the surgery. So um, the only solution I could think of, because I couldn't bear to cancel it, was I asked Chuck, my husband, to go. And so while I was recovering in the hospital, Chuck was at a yoga retreat in Massachusetts. And it's something that he, <laughs> for a long time, wouldn't let me tell anybody, but he did it to help me out and to help his sister out. So, um, so that worked out okay, too. And then, you know, within... Um, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was at my daughter's high school graduation and I was back on the bike a couple of weeks after that with, with Gonzalo and friends and then went to Japan and saw my daughter racing in the world championships and, uh, and had a, like a, re a really special holiday and even got to ride my bike there. So this was all just for sort of six weeks after the surgery. And, and I show those stories 
um, you know, to, 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 to also make the point of how, how well, you know, how well I was able to recover after the surgery. This is uh, also saw lots more soccer after that as well. Um, and, um, and as you know, I was, um, as you've seen this photo already, but I was so happy that Rob recovered so well as well. So finally, um, what lovely things happened after I donated? Well, it was crazy when I went back to work. Um, the whole hospital was smiling at me. I, I had never, it was a really neat, special thing to learn. Um, people I didn't know, they would give me thumbs up when they saw me in the hall. People would stop and bless me. Um, people, you know, like all kinds of amazing things. And I, the kindness just kept coming my way and, and to my patients too, and to my family. And it was really, um, it was, it was, it really kind of blew me away. It was like a tsunami of gratitude and, and kindness. And it, it was not something I expected. It was lovely. This is actually a, a digital um, tapestry that my daughter made for me. I, uh, it's a bit of fun, but to sort of show the, how the world felt to me after donating, but it was just, it was all, you know, chocolate chip cookies and, <laughs> and people smiling and giving thumbs up. <laughs> I'm going to close just by saying that um, I still find it hard talking about being a liver donor, but I, it feels really important to me um, and I'm learning to do it. Um, I'm kind of a private person, so I think that's why I find it difficult, but um, I, I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to all of you guys about it. And, and I realize that for lots of people, it would be a much harder process. Um, not everyone has a close friend who's a liver transplant surgeon um, who can, they can, um, easily ask all their questions of. Um, not everyone has come from the privileged situation that I come from, that I was not worried about my job or supporting my family. And I had really all the supports in the world and an amazing su uh, supportive team at work. So I, I, I like the idea of trying to help others be less scared about the possibility, um, maybe seeing it as something more doable by sharing my experience. And, and in fact, I've had a couple, two friends who've donated since um, and, and they've both done really well. And I was, I was so happy to be able to talk to them ahead of it and, and, and let them know what it, what it had been like for me. So I'm gonna close on that. And thank you very much for your time. Wow. I feel like I should bless you as well. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for this you know, phenomenal insight into your both personal and kind of professional evolution through this. You're both incredibly inspiring. Um, and I'm sure you have about 115 fans here that I'm acutely <laughs> aware of. And so, you know, I obviously, I wanna celebrate your altruism and the learning and all the giving back that has um, emerged through this um, experience, but it's a surgical ethics uh, panel. So I also, I'm gonna try to ask a few uh, more challenging questions. And also if people wanna add some questions to the Q and A or to the chat, We'll try and address those as well. Or if you want to raise your hand, we can um, open it. But I, I will start with a few questions. Um, the first is about privilege. And Marie, you, you did sort of mention a little bit about your own uh, privilege to be able to take time off and whatnot. But I'm interested in knowing if either of you have thought more about the influence that, you know, Rob's um, as a physician, for example, and with an extremely strong, um, wonderful advocate, um, kind of afforded you and, um, you know, if you had not been a physician, for example, do you think the outcome would have been the same? Could you have gotten this incredible gift? Would you have given this incredible gift? So I'm just curious if... I, I, I can start. I think that... Um... I, I really think that being a physician made it easier for me to be a donor, you know, for a lot of the reasons that I've said, and I can imagine that for so many people, it would be, um, it would be so much more scary and there would be many more um, barriers to them being able to, to, to make this decision and to, to be off work, et cetera. Um, so to me, that, that was really a factor. I think that, um, you know, I, Rob, Rob being a, a physician and Mark being a physician, other than that, that's how I knew them. I, I don't think that that impacted my decision to donate. To me, they were friends in need, and I and and I was perhaps at a time in my life where I was 
for, as I mentioned, I was really um, kind of very, you know, concerned about access to, to donors for people with, you know, for, with friends and patients who'd been, who, who'd been very sick. So to me, that was a, a very separate thing. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting thing. It just kind of makes me, it, it reminds me about, you know, the people I read about during all, you know, in the last few years who've, who've done non-directed organ donations. And I think, wow, like that's like a, that's a whole other thing that I, I don't know that I, it has never occurred. It had never occurred to me anyway. Um, and to read about the incredibly uh, generous people that make a non-directed donation, that to me is like a, you know, a whole other level that I, that I hadn't really considered. Um, so I'm not sure I've totally answered your question, but I've tried my best from my perspective. Rob, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I mean, uh, Maria and I were in very different situations, right? Because I was helpless um, and she was on the cusp of making a, a voluntary decision to do something immense. Uh, whereas I, I, I was just, you know, very much in need and unable to help myself in any way. And so it's, it, it was a very different kind of perspective, for sure. Uh, but it was just astounding to me that this international search, you know, came back and fell so close to the tree. Uh, and that somebody from my own hospital had actually stepped forward uh, to make uh, this incredible gift. Um, and, and it, it, uh, it was very humbling, uh, for sure, uh, to realize that something so close to home could actually transform my life in the way that it has. Amazing. Um, another question about transplant um, in general. And, you know, Marie, you got to sort of exert your autonomy and, you know, take the risk to help uh, another person. And Rob, you talk about how we're sort of designed to be, to be donors. Do either of you think that there is potential for an ethical system with safeguards that would be able to uh, commodify organs, um, you know, again, ethically, so that the donor um, would receive benefits other than the psychological ones that altruistic donors um, get? So, whether it's you know not necessarily direct payment, but expenses incurred, um, paid leave, or like in some countries there's reciprocal altruism. So if you're willing to donate, you're higher on the list for a donation, things like that. So are there is there any way to you know increase this um, that would be possible? I think I could speak to that, uh, Karen, uh, if I may. Um, I think, well, I know that in many jurisdictions, uh, donors are um, compensated in some form, uh, usually in the form of uh, funeral expenses, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and, and that seems you know, uh, like a very legitimate and um, humanistic you know, way to approach it. Uh, certainly a number of European countries have uh, presumed consent for organ donation. And um, maybe that is something that, that we uh, might eventually move towards to increase the pool of, uh, of organ donors. Um, uh, yeah, all, all of these things are, are, are important initiatives. Uh, they exist already uh, to a certain extent. Can they be expanded upon? I'm sure, uh, but these conversations need to happen. They need to happen in a very transparent fashion. And, um, and with all the stakeholders, you know, at the table, uh, so that it's a fair and open discussion, uh, because they are, they're real issues, uh, and uh, deserve our attention. Thank you. Um, there's a question on, uh, from Marie, how you made the decision on whether or not to waive your anonymity um, as a donor. Yeah, um, you know, I, I definitely appreciated being anonymous at the beginning, because I think Rob said it best. It's just, you know, the whole way along, there was so many, I was, you know, thinking about so many things and, and I don't and and, you know, questioning whether it was, you know, when, when I didn't even know whether I was a good match or not, it was like, you know, I, I, I wasn't really, we weren't really at that final stage of decision. So I was pretty sure that this is what I wanted to do. That's why I was going down this path. But, you know, the people in the transplant program kept saying, you know, you can change your mind at any time. 
And every time they'd say that to me, I'd think, wow, like that would be quite something to turn around now, but I guess, you know, it's good to know it's possible, you know? Um, so, so, you know, all that thinking along the way made me kind of relieved to, to be anonymous because I thought, um, you know, that was that, that made it a little bit more comfortable and private, the, the process for me. But then once I decided, in fact, once I heard that I was a good match, I, first of all, I felt like I was really excited from that moment on. Like I was like, okay, let's do it. Can we do it next week? Was what I asked the, the surgeon because <laughs> um, I felt really ready and happy and excited to go forward. And then I also felt that, you know, since I was going to go forward, that it, it didn't make sense really to me anymore to, to keep it a secret. Um, and I thought it would be a really hard thing to keep a secret. And I think, you know, in medicine, we're not very good about that. Um, talking about doctors as patients, there's often a lot of loss of confidentiality too. So I kind of thought, you know what, maybe it's better just to be out in the open about it. And then when I talked to Rob, I think we both agreed. We said, let's just like talk about it and, and not have people thinking they could, you know, whispering or wondering or, you know, have, having there be anything uncomfortable about it at all. We both just agreed. Um, and so I, I felt good about it, but I, I wasn't well prepared. As I said, I was definitely, I felt really nervous about the first time I talked to Rob and Mark about it. Um, but I was, I felt very positive about it and, and thought it was the right thing to be, to be talking to people. Turns out we would have run into each other on the ward too. So, <laughs> um, um, I'm curious if either of you have, so you discussed sort of being the patient, what about the physicians taking care of you? Um, and I don't know, any insights from them on the sort of added stress of taking care of two physicians? And, you know, um, as you said, they're all excellent clinicians and they know what they're doing and they've got, you know, great teams, but have you guys spoken to, to other uh, physicians who were caring for you and, and that experience? I have a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, I was wondering about this at times too, because I know I feel nervous looking after other doctors or maybe nervous isn't the right word, but kind of self-aware, you know, and sort of, and, and, and I try very hard to kind of treat them like other patients, but I feel like I have to apologize for that ahead of time, you know, but that's sort of my usual approach, but I wondered too, and I, and I certainly didn't want any doctor to be feeling um, awkward or not following their usual protocols when they looked after me. So I, that was definitely something I thought about. And I had actually made a slide about, it was one of the other scary things in the process is that um, ahead, and I hope Gonzalo won't mind me telling this story, but ahead of when, when I said, okay, let's go ahead. Can we do the surgery next week? And then they were, they were sort of saying, well, maybe the week after, et cetera. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm already booked off next week because I'm supposed to go on that trip cycling trip and that would be good for me to you know take some of my time out of that time and um and so I actually called Gonzalo about it. I was like you know what I sh you know I'm sorry to miss the bike trip but I think I should do the surgery sooner because that will be work out better for me at work and he said you know what I would maybe accept that but he said the problem is we're going to have two of our colleagues in the operating room at the same time and so we're all a bit we're all feeling a bit tense about that and we want to all be here so he said I can't I, you know, I need to be here. Even if I'm not your surgeon, I need to be here with my colleagues when you and Rob are having your surgery. And that actually, that sort of, um, it, 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 I was really touched that he told me that, but it also kind of stressed me. I thought, wow, they're nervous about us. <laughs> that hadn't really occurred to me, you know? So I think it was a bit stressful for them. Rob, how about you? Any Karen, I'm, I mean, I have contact with uh, all of the doctors who looked after me and, and continue to look after me. And uh, I think from the very beginning, I, I did ask them to please uh, just talk to me as if I was any other patient that I knew nothing a priori. Um, don't depart from your usual banter or the way you pitch this uh, to a patient because that's what you do best. That's what you're most experienced with. And don't try to reinvent this discussion with me uh, because I don't have the knowledge that you have, frankly. And I was just very grateful uh, for their care. And it was exemplary, I must say. Rob, there are so many you know, insights uh, that you've gained about being a physician um, through this 
experience basically of being on the other side or of suffering, do you think that the rest of us can come to, you know, those insights and, and, you know, use those teachings um, for, like, do you think that that can be, that that can be taught to people? Uh, you were asking the question about empathy, whether it's, you know, natural or teachable. So all of these insights you've given us, do they, must they come from an experience of suffering? I hope that there's something uh, in this conversation that we're having today that people uh, who uh, are listening can resonate with. I, I think it's possible that, that they can. Uh, I don't think, as I said, one does not have to be wounded to be a good healer, just open-minded. And this is all we're asking of people who may want to participate in this new curriculum is be open-minded. And, and if you can resonate with any of this stuff, you can be so effective at uh, teaching others to be reflective in their own practice, in their own lives, et cetera, about these topics. Um, you know, uh, most human beings don't encounter uh, this decision-making or this experience uh, in their lifetime, but uh, they encounter other things, you know, and as I said, you know, the, the people in the waiting area, many of them had stories that were so much more dramatic than my own. Um, and I acknowledge that completely. Uh, so, you know, yes, I, I think that everybody can resonate to a piece of it at least and, uh, and just bring that, you know, to their own um, actions, uh, their own conversations, and uh, their own um, a way of, you know, uh, if, if this is going to move forward, just, you know, how they can participate in some way to help this uh, become really front and center on our radar screen, because I think that it, it deserves a place there. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, Karen, I see there's a nice question yes. from Blaine in the in the chat. Do you want to take that one first, and then yes, if sure. there's time, I, I can ask one. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Blaine says, very moving to hear. Thank you both for sharing. Rob, you mentioned how this changed your approach as a physician healer. I'm curious how it changed either of your approach to informed consent specifically. Do either of you find yourself explaining surgeries or procedures to patients differently? I guess I, I can speak to that. I think to a certain extent, uh, but maybe not a large extent. Um, I, I had uh, my surgery explained to me uh, uh, in a very transparent fashion uh, about everything that could happen. You know, uh, you can die and, and then it only got better from that. Uh, uh, so, you know, it, I, I had a very fulsome discussion uh, with uh, my surgeons there were two of them, uh, and also uh, my physician, uh, my hepatologist, uh, who added a lot to the discussion, et cetera. So that was, that was you know, fantastic for me to hear that from them. And frankly, uh, I probably learned something uh, from the way they handled me in that situation with, uh, that I could apply to the way I handle others in that situation, other you know, uh, physicians who become my patients uh, and my patients in general, I suppose, you know, uh, informed consent is um, so important and we sometimes don't do it so well uh, or it's uh, less than um, uh, complete or just a little bit, you know, on the margins of, of where the reality uh, strikes. So uh, yes, I, I think I did learn something uh, from all the people who treated me and, it, and I, I, I carry that with me, I guess, in, in some respect uh, in, in the way I treat others. Um, and I think there's one last question um, from the Q&A from Rito. Being on the other side is challenging. Thank you for sharing. Rob, can you share what your wife experienced as being a physician and spouse? or parent um, that is challenging as well. Thank you for a very special evening. Thank you for the question. It's, it's so important. Um, I have to tell you that this was a, a hideous odyssey that had a fantastically happy outcome. Uh, it was so difficult uh, for Margaret and my children uh, to go through this, um, to see me getting so sick, you know, so sick that I was unable to work 
couldn't drive, et cetera, that was not easy to digest for any of them. And of course, each of them grappled with the idea of being a donor themselves and came forward and volunteered and it just didn't work out for various reasons. Um, often size mismatching because I'm, you know, pretty tall, big guy and uh, their livers were just too small. Um, so uh, it, it was not easy at all by any means, but they were all to a person. They were so supportive of me through this. Once they understood what was really going on for a period of time, they didn't know why I was so sick and I didn't know why I was getting so sick. You know, there was this Stevens Johnson syndrome thing in the background and it might take months to get better, but clearly I was getting much sicker than would have been predicted uh, based on a simple case of Stevens Johnson syndrome. This became a very complicated case of one um, and it was not easy for any of them. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to each of them for their participation, for their support, uh, and, and, and for their optimism and, and, and feeling that, you know, there was a way out of this, that there was going to be an end to this uh, at the uh, other side of the tunnel, so to speak. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time uh, for us to wrap up the 2022 Belfort Lecture. I'd like to thank uh, Karen at first for hosting uh, this evening and also for asking the questions at the end. Uh, this was an, an incredible uh, story, um, very heartwarming at a time when we need good news. Um, and the outcome was spectacular as you, you've all witnessed and seen. We had well over a hundred people attending today. So Rob and Marie, thank you so much for sharing with us this uh, incredible journey, this, this story on how uh, you each helped uh, each other. And we are very grateful to you. We do have some small tokens of our appreciation, which you will be receiving shortly in, in the mail, but uh, really on behalf of the Department of Surgery and all of us, uh, we are indebted to you for uh, truly advancing our academic program with the Belfort Lecture. Thanks to everyone this evening. Have a good, good night all, and look forward to seeing you at our next lecture. Thank you, Jim, and thank okay. you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen.